Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to. Uh, okay, welcome to the uh, uh, S3D uh, virtual seminar uh, in February. Uh, this time we have two speakers from Hui, uh, Professor Matt Stretch, and uh, he's a student, Emma Bilic. Uh, Matt is well known by many colleagues. Uh, he is the director of the uh, USPO C grant and the center scientist at, at, at Hui. Uh, he got his uh, uh, bachelor degree in chemical oceanography at the Florida Institute of uh, Technology uh, in 1994, and he's a PhD also uh, in chemical oceanography uh, at the University of, uh, of Rhode Island in 1998. He did a lot of work about S3D. Uh, also about iridium ice depths in gel traces uh, in open oceans and uh, polar oceans. Uh, Emma Bulek is uh, uh, Matt's PhD, PhD student. Uh, she got her bachelor degree in chemistry in 2019 uh, at Halford College. Uh, she's currently a PhD student, the third year, right, Emma? Is this is a third year, okay. All right, uh, so today, um, the title of their talk is uh, Seasonal Cycles in Submarine Groundwater Discharge to an Arctic Coastal Lagoon. Um, Matt, again, uh, would like to share the time with Emma. You know, he would uh, do uh, introduction of the project, and Emma uh, could discuss the results and the uh, findings. All right, you guys, time Great. is yours. Thanks, Bo Chow. Emma, if you want to start um, sharing, I'll just quickly introduce the project before turning it over to you. So this is part of a National Science Foundation project between Bayani Cardenas, Jim McClelland, and, and myself. And um, it's designed to take a deep dive into the processes that drive submarine groundwater discharge in high latitude coastal systems. And so Emma and I used, our part of the project was to use radium isotopes to quantify the SGD. And because this is a very complicated system from a hydrogeologic and oceanographic point of view, the approach requires a very careful accounting of the various radium sources and sinks. And um, as you'll see today, I think Emma has done a really great, great job of doing that. So um, we appreciate any feedback you, you might uh, have and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Emma. Thanks. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, my name is Emma Bullock. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the MIT Hui Joint Program. Um, and today I'm talking about seasonal cycles um, in submarine groundwater discharge to Simpson Lagoon, which is an Arctic coastal lagoon along the Beaufort Sea. Oops. Okay, so before I really get into it, I want to put in this caveat, which is that this is very much a work in progress. Um, this system uh, has turned out to be quite different from a lot of other more temperate systems that people might be used to uh, seeing or working with. So while I go through the results and you kind of uh, see what we've um, put together and see some of the assumptions we've made, I want you to ask yourselves, do you think that submarine groundwater discharge is occurring in this system, or if it's only occurring during a certain season. Um, and I'd love to hear any thoughts or feedback at the end of the talk. So before I get into results, um, I want to kind of set the stage and talk about how um, the water in the Arctic uh, moves a little differently than the way it does in more temperate systems. So, um, you know, in a more temperate system like one on Cape Cod, you might have groundwater moving year round, or you might have it uh, moving for most of the year with only a short period where it's too cold for it to really move much. Um, but in the Arctic, the movement of groundwater and water in general is really uh, kind of um, isolated to a couple months in late spring through mid fall. Um, the seasons that we're going to talk about today uh, involve the thaw period, the open water period, and free thaw. So the thaw period is when uh, temperatures in the Arctic rise from winter lows of about negative 40 um, to just above freezing by late May. Um, this causes breakup of river and lagoon ice in late May to mid-June. 
And some of you might be familiar with the term uh, spring freshet, which is when this meltwater causes the largest discharge of river water um, into the coastal area um, for the entire season. The next period is the open water period where there's no longer any land fast ice um, and there's no lagoon ice that uh, can be observed. Temperatures tend to range from just above freezing to about 13 degrees Celsius. And the active layer continues to deepen until um, about mid-fall. The active layer is also somewhat unique in this system compared to more temperate systems. It's the um, layer of soil that is thawed enough for groundwater to move through it. And generally in our site, it was between 50 to 100 centimeters. So uh, on the grand scheme, uh, scheme of things, this is a pretty thin aquifer um, compared to most template sites, but it is, um, when we are considering groundwater movement or especially fresh groundwater movement, um, it's a really narrow layer that we're considering in this uh, system. The final season is freeze up where temperatures um, start to drop below freezing to about negative seven to negative nine degrees or negative 12 degrees in October. Um, because the air temperatures are now colder than the soil, the soil begins to freeze from the top down until it eventually reaches the permafrost ice. The study, uh, the study site that we looked at was Simpson Lagoon along the north slope of Alaska. Um, it's a long and relatively narrow lagoon, uh, somewhat shallow with an average depth of only two meters. Um, and it receives freshwater inputs from multiple rivers, including the Colville, Kaparik, and Putt rivers, uh, which drain the majority of the North Slope. Uh, you can see um, in this little breakout here, uh, the sampling sites, we got a few uh, groundwater transects, um, and we also did a cross section of the lagoon. Um, for our lagoon sampling, we also noticed that there was a seasonal salinity stratification of the lagoon. Um, this gray block out here um, at the top during the thaw period is where there was still ice. So we were there with it when there was still uh, quite a bit of ice left in the lagoon. Um, once you get to the open water period, there's no longer any ice, but we observed a uh, higher salinity layer in the bottom you know, half meter of the lagoon, maybe a little, uh, maybe even a little thinner, um, with the top of the lagoon being pretty fresh, uh, likely due to large river inputs. And then when we went in October of 2022 during the freeze up period, um, the lagoon was well mixed and had a much higher salinity than um, observed in any of the other time periods. Uh, kind of jumping right into some of the results, um, we sampled uh, groundwater and surface waters for uh, radium. Today I'm going to be talking about three different isotopes, the two shortest lived isotopes, 224 and 223 radium, which have half-lives of about three and a half days and a little over 11 days, um, respectively, and 226 radium, which has a half-life of about 1600 years. So uh, doing this, we can get um, some different time scales that uh, we're able to look at. Um, we uh, sampled groundwater during um, two open water periods and one thaw and one freeze up period. And as you can see, there's uh, slight seasonal differences. The, the thaw period tended to have slightly higher radium values, maybe because of longer residence times within the aquifer. Um, however, all of the isotopes are actually pretty low when we compare to other sites, more temperate sites um, for groundwater radium. Um, we had a couple high outliers for each season, but in general, you can see they're kind of clustering down towards zero. Um, for surface water, we saw much more clear seasonal uh, differences in the lagoon radium. Uh, the lowest values were these uh, pink values, which are from the thaw period in June. Um, those are low, likely because most of the water that we were sampling was fresh melt water from either rivers or lagoon ice melting. 
Um, the open water periods were pretty consistent across both years in both August and July. We saw um, mid values a little bit higher than thaw, but not crazy. And then um, we saw uh, most of the values increase during the freeze up October period um, when the salinities in the lagoon were higher. You can also see that the Beaufort Sea end member, which is um, a, uh, it comes from an accumulation of historic data, which I'll talk about a little later, um, is quite a bit lower than most of these radium values for uh, both the open water periods and the freeze up period, um, which kind of gives us an indicator that, you know, this isn't just uh, this this spike in radium during the higher salinity period isn't just Beaufort shelf water coming in and supplying that. This radium has to be coming from somewhere else. So to give you guys an idea of how kind of different these results are from a more template system, um, I'm going to just compare to one template system that's been studied pretty well for radium, and that is Wakoit Bay in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Uh, Wakoit Bay has fine to coarse sand and gravel, um, which leads to highly permeable bottom sediments and its aquifer. Um, it's a tidally influenced bay with a tidal range of about a meter. Um, and as you can see from the radium isotopes, the bay surface radium is quite a bit lower than the groundwater radium. You can see that even the lowest groundwater um, radium values for each of these three isotopes is still higher than the highest value observed for the bay surface. So when we're considering this in a model, it should be pretty easy to identify um, whether or not groundwater is inputting um, uh, radium to the system based on the excess because of this high radium signal that it has. If we compare that now to Simpson Lagoon, first we see that the the you know hydrology of the system is pretty different. Simpson Lagoon, um, its bottom sediments are uh, usually fine sand and clays due to the fact that most of these sediments are sourced from river erosion due to those large rivers inputting into the lagoon. Uh, this leads to a much lower hydraulic conductivity than Wakoit Bay. Um, and instead of being tidally influenced, its uh, water level changes are largely wind driven. And this is because the Beaufort Sea in general is kind of uh, sometimes called a, a tideless uh, sea. Um, so instead, the major influence in water level changes come from wind direction and strength. Um, but in terms of uh, radium, we also see significant changes. So uh, before where we had this nice separation of the bay surface values versus the groundwater values, now we see significant overlap in the ranges of groundwater and lagoon surface water. Um, while the groundwater, the, the maximum values are still higher than the, the um, values for the lagoon surface, you can see that for 223 radium and 226 radium, that maximum value isn't really all that different than the highest values we see in the lagoon surface. And remember that we only had maybe one or two outliers that had these maximum values during the open water. Oh, when we're considering this in terms of a model, it's going to be much harder to separate um, a distinct groundwater signal. That being said, we still um, uh, did this using a box model for radium. So this is a typical way of trying to uh, figure out SGD inputs using radium. If you can identify or account for all of the other inputs and outputs and um, uh, do that with a pretty good certainty, then you can attribute the excess radium still in the lagoon to SGD inputs. So over the uh, rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we accounted for these other inputs and outputs, um, which include riverine inputs, both the dissolved inputs and desorption from suspended sediments, um, diffusion from bottom sediments, um, and loss by mixing with the uh, Beaufort Sea.
I'm not going to talk too much about uh, we suspended sediments because we uh, found out that that was pretty negligible um, or lost by radioactive decay because that's just a radioactive decay equation. But before we get into that, um, I'd like you to remember that we have this seasonal salinity stratification during the open water period. Um, this uh, layer of salt water at the bottom indicates that there might be minimal mixing going on between the top of the lagoon that's more fresh water and the bottom of the lagoon, um, which has this higher salinity. So for the open water period, we decided to do a two box model where we have our riverine inputs coming into the top layer and we have diffusion from bottom sediments coming into the bottom layer. Otherwise, everything uh, is held the same. So our first input is the dissolved inputs from rivers. So uh, if you look at these bar, pl uh, bar plots down here, we've separated um, three the three rivers that we sampled into their uh, different sampling periods. Um, we sampled the, the Kaparic River, which is um, smaller than the Colville, but is still a major river on the North Slope. Uh, the Pot River, which is similar in size to the Kaparic, maybe a little bit smaller. And we also sampled a stream called No Point Creek in order to see if there were significant differences between these large gauged rivers and the other runoff. Um, as you can see, the range in terms of concentration of radium isotopes for all three are pretty small, uh, with 224 ranging from about um, two to six at its maximum, but staying around two to three for most of the time period and for most of the rivers. Um, and we see similar uh, ranges um, with 223 ranging just from 0.1 dpm to 0.6 and 226 ranging um, from about two to six. So these are pretty small differences in terms of the concentration of the radium isotopes across the different seasons um, and different river sizes. So what ends up happening is that discharge, uh, the water discharge is what dominates when radium isotopes from rivers in the dissolved form um, are important. So the largest input of dissolved radium comes in June when discharge is at its highest due to the spring freshet and all that meltwater coming in. Um, the open water periods uh, across both years that were sampled had similar water fluxes that were uh, a bit lower than our spring water flux. And then the lowest discharge was in late September, early October, um, as the rivers are starting to peter out during the freeze up period. The uh, next major input from rivers um, is the desorption from suspended sediment. So uh, for those who might be unaware, um, when suspended sediments in rivers uh, enter that estuary where the salinity starts to change, um, ion exchange can happen where radium ends up being desorbed from these sediments and input into the coastal system. Um, so for the Kaparic and Pup rivers, there was a model that was developed uh, by Crete et al. in 1992, which uh, related water discharge to suspended sediment concentration. So I used this model um, to get the suspended sediment concentration um, for uh, the weeks that we were sampling and the week prior. Uh, for the Coville River, we don't have um, a similar type of model. And because it's a much larger river, um, I didn't want to use uh, the same model for it. So instead, um, we know the total annual suspended sediment load, and we know that about 70% of this load is discharged in June. Uh, so what I did was I uh, took the June suspended sediment load, applied it to June, and then divided the remaining suspended sediment um, between July, August, September, and October, proportionately according to their water fluxes. Um, up at the top, uh, corner here, you'll see um, the values that I used for desorption for 224 radium and 223 radium. These are based on emanation experiments, not desorption experiments, and we're using this as an estimate for the surface bound radium um, that could be desorbed. 
um, we are planning on doing desorption experiments in the near future, uh, but for now, this is the value um, that we're using. You might notice that these values are quite low compared to some other rivers, um, but this uh, system, the North Slope, has um, sediments that are highly organic. So that could be uh, a contributing factor. It could either be, um, you know, there's there's just not as much radium in these sediments, which could also be one of the reasons that the groundwater um, values are so low in radium. And there could also be uh, factors uh, related to the KD with higher organics in the water. So for now, these are the values that we're using, but we hope to refine them in the near future. The next input um, is diffusion from bottom sediment. So these we did determine experimentally in the lab. We took uh, Simpson Lagoon bottom sediment and put them uh, in an in incubator chamber with uh, radium-free water. And we ran these experiments for about 22 days in order to, to a semi-steady state with our shortest lived isotope, 224 radium, and get at least two half-lives in for 223 radium. Um, the diffusive fluxes, uh, which are shown by the blue line and the arrows are shown by the dotted lines on the graphs to the right, um, were estimated um, or calculated uh, based on the model developed by Beck et al. in 2007, where the total inventory in the system um, is related to the diffusive flux based on the surface area, not so the, the area of the sediment core, um, and the decay constant of the isotope, uh, which is in this equation that I show down here. You'll notice that the total inventory in the system is considerably higher during the saline incubation compared to the brackish incubation. Um, and this was seen across the board for all of the isotopes that uh, we uh, were looking at. Um, so when we did our model, we used the, the brackish incubation um, diffusive flux for the open water periods, since even the higher salinity layer at the bottom was lower than the near salt water, uh, near um, ocean water salinities that we were seeing in the lagoon during um, the freeze up period when we use uh, the saline flux here. You might also notice that there's uh, these um, values in red here. Um, that uh, we think might be due to um, resuspension in these early periods uh, before the sediment had had time to settle out. Um, the values that weren't outliers here that were down here is after I noticed this and started taking a lot more care not to resuspend sediment during the incubation. So I'm showing it for um, the sake of showing all of the data, but just keep in mind that those red values were not used in uh, the diffusive flux um, calculation. So finally, uh, the last um, part that I'm going to talk about is our output, which is mixing with the Beaufort C. So the end member for the Beaufort C that I used is taken from data compiled by Dabrowski et al. in 2022 which also utilized historical data shown um, from the references below. Um, they uh, took samples from um, along the Beaufort uh, Sea coastline. Um, and here in this little star is Simpson Lagoon. So they did get pretty close uh, to where Simpson Lagoon is. Um, I only took data from the upper water column um, and averaged that in order to get an ocean end member estimate for what might be mixing. Um, with Simpson Lagoon. And you can see um, in the table that 226 radium, the longest lived isotope, now has a higher concentration than the two short lived isotopes. And this is what we'd expect as uh, a water body moves away from its source, away from the sediments, um, the short lived isotopes decay away, and we get um, the remaining 226 radium and 228 radium uh, that's left over. So um, the end member isn't the only thing that we need to take into account when we're determining mixing. We also need to uh, find out the apparent water age in order to figure out how much is mixing 
um, and how fast it's doing that. So the way this is often done in radium SGD studies is by taking um, this model that was created from Moore et al. in 2006, where you uh, relate the incoming radium flux, so the major input of radium to the system, the activity ratio of your short-lived isotope to your long-lived isotope. You subtract the inventory in your system, uh, so in this case, the lagoon surface, and you divide that by the total inventory's activity ratio and correct for the decay of the short-lived isotope. Um, so when we did this, we got pretty reasonable values for July and August of about 8.8 .8 days and 8.4 days respectively. Um, however, we got a very short apparent water age in October of only 1.4 days. Um, so this seemed a little unreasonable for us, especially since our river inputs to the lagoon have actually gone down in October. So it didn't make a lot of sense that the residence time in October would be shorter than during the open water period. Um, so in order to kind of put a check on that, we used a tidal prism model um, to get a physical basis for a residence time. I know that um, tidal prism model is not uh, supposed to be used in a uh, estuary that's really wind influenced. However, when I looked at the patterns of wind water level changes um, from our water level gauges, it's actually very uh, uniform. The wind was switching direction about every 12 hours. So uh, we ended up having um, a pretty low standard deviation when we looked at um, the lows versus the highs um, for our quote tidal period um, and our water level changes overall. So Despite the fact that it's not technically a tide, uh, we were seeing pretty uh, consistent water level changes. Um, so I decided to go ahead and use the tidal prism model to get a, a physical basis for a residence time in the lagoon. Um, and you can see that it's um, a couple of days shorter than our uh, radium estimate for the open water period, but it's longer for the October period with more on par with the open water residence times. Uh, we also decided to use the freshwater inputs in order to get an estimate for um, the uh, approximate flushing time of this system. So consider this kind of a, a maximum value for how long the residence time is. Um, and that gave us a value of about eight for August, 10 for July, and 11 for October. So about in line with what we'd expect based on the river input fluxes. Um, but that leads us to the question. We now have all of these potential residence times. How much is the water flux in our model dependent on the residence time? So for um, all of these different residence times and a few others uh, based on varying the activity ratios to, to figure out the, the radium estimate, we found that um, the model is related to, uh, dependent on the residence times in a somewhat exponential way um, with the open water periods um, being uh, much lower in a total scale for SGD than the freeze up period. Um, despite the fact that um, the residence time choice still is important and still um, will change the potential SGD flux substantially, it's important to notice that for the freeze up period, even the longest residence time um, where it starts to kind of flatten off and, and, and reach an asymptote, um, that value is still more than five times higher than what we're seeing for the open water period. So even if our residence times are way off, um, we can still be pretty certain that the SGD estimate for October is going to give us a much higher flux than what we were seeing in either of the open water periods. Um, however, for our model, I decided to use the um, residence time that was based on uh, the physical data 
um, just because I was more certain in that physical data than I was in the activity ratio for radium. One of the um, potential issues with that model, that, that radium model for estimating the apparent water age, is the fact that it assumes that the major input of radium is consistent across um, the, the different periods that you're looking at. So I was assuming that the activity ratio, the end member for groundwater would be what was important for all of the different seasons. Um, but as you'll see later, the major input of radium into this system might actually be changing over the course of the year. So um, this model might not be, uh, this radium uh, water age model might not be um, uh, possible to use in this system, or at least not in the form it currently is. Um, the other thing I'd like to note here is that you'll notice that I haven't been talking about the thaw period. There's no uh, June um, box model shown here. And that's because uh, with the large river inputs, both from desorption and the dissolved inputs in June, we actually see absolutely no excess of radium in the lagoon. So we don't see any evidence of SGD um, during the thaw period. And that kind of makes sense. You know, there's still land fast ice. Uh, the ground is still almost completely frozen, um, so we don't really expect to see much mixing with the sediments or with the pool water. Um, so here is uh, the first result from our total box model, um, and that's the importance of the individual input terms over the course of the year. So these have been um, normalized to a percent so that it's easier to compare. Um, but again, remember that the freeze-up period, um, the overall um, SGD value here is, is significantly larger um, than what we're seeing in the open water period by about five times. Um, but um, just starting from thaw, we see that there's, again, there's no SGD. The major input during thaw is desorption from rivers. Um, followed by diffusion from bottom sediments and the dissolved inputs from rivers. Um, and this is the same for uh, both 224 and 223 with just switching the um, diffusion and the river inputs. Um, but again, it's dominated by desorption. Um, during the open water periods, we start to see this shift. Desorption becomes less important. Um, diffusion becomes more important, and we start to see some marine groundwater discharge um, becoming necessary to fill that excess of radium that we see in the lagoon. However, it's not until uh, freeze up that SGD starts to dominate significantly, um, followed by diffusion, and then again, river desorption. Um, another thing I'd like to note here is that uh, the diffusion value here um, is a much higher, well, not much, it's, it's about two times higher than uh, the diffusion flux coming during the open water period. So despite the fact that diffusion is higher during the, open, during the uh, freeze up period, um, we're still seeing a large increase in the proportionate importance of SGD. And that's the same for, for both short lived isotopes. Um, the final thing that I want to really talk about in terms of the box model is the importance of the uh, end member for groundwater. So the groundwater end member that we chose was based on um, the, not, not necessarily one of those high outliers, but it was based on um, the two highest values that were uh, pretty close to each other and there was at least two of them. Um, so we omitted any super, super high outliers and chose the next highest values for our groundwater end member. And uh, we did this because we weren't sure if those extremely high outliers were due to uh, long residence time. Maybe that's not actually um, indicative of what's going into the lagoon. Um, this system is incredibly heterogeneous with peat often blocking water paths. So 
that's why we chose a value that was high, but it was at least two values that were similar um, in our groundwater data. However, um, as I showed before, there's a lot of variability in the range of the groundwater values that we were seeing. So we decided to do a sensitivity analysis on um, the what what uh, how important the end member value for SGD is in terms of the water flux that it gives us in the model. So um, you can see that the model is is actually pretty robust when you get into these these higher values, um, and it really starts to uh, increase substantially um, when you get down towards. Um, you know, four and, and 300 DPM per meters cubed. Um, and again, a similar thing in um, July of 2022, where it really starts to increase when you get down to four and 300 DPM per meter cubed. Um, I'm only showing 224 here because the results were, were pretty similar for, for 223. This is just an example, pretty much. Um, you can also see that um, the Values, the, the um, best estimate values of swimming groundwater discharge during the two different uh, open water periods that we sampled are, are actually quite close. Um, with the larger error for August 2021, we're not as sharp, but uh, both are between, you know, around 0 0.7, um, 0 0.7 to 1 um, meters cubed per day into the lagoon from groundwater. For October, again, we have a much higher flux um, and the best estimate value is kind of getting into that range where um, if we had chosen a lower value, it would substantially increase the SGD water flux into the system. But our best estimate was uh, 10 times 10 to the seven meters cubed per day, which is, you know, um, much higher than the 0.7 times 10 to the meters cubed per day that we were observing during July. But the question comes, is this excess of radium in the freeze up period actually due, due to SGD? Um, a couple other explanations could be the fact that um, we observed high sustained easterly winds when uh, we were sampling during October. This decreased the lagoon water level and increased wave action. So this could have increased wind-driven circulation through bottom sediments, um, potentially changing the uh, end member ratio, uh, the end member values for radium going into the system. There could have also been um, a density uh, impact as the salinity in the lagoon was much higher than what we observed during the open water periods. Um, that increased salinity could have driven advective flow between um, the overlying more saline water and fresh or poor waters underneath. And this could also have played a factor in the um, river deltas as uh, the rivers started to peter off. Saline water could have shifted um, uh, the estuary into a more saline regime, encroached up the estuary. Um, and this could both have dissorbed sediments that had been deposited in the estuary earlier in the season, as well as increase the uh, diffusive flux and um, advective flow in these locations. So all of these are factors that could account or could play a part in that excess radium we were seeing in October. And finally, just to give you guys um, a comparison to the, the rest of the study, which our colleagues were doing more hydrological based um, estimates. During the July 2022, um, the estimated fresh groundwater flux um, that was calculated by a PhD student at the University of Texas, Sean Sudemir, was about 920 meters cubed per day per kilometer of coastline. Um, my estimated total SGD uh, using the radium box model um, was eight times 10 to the four meters cubed per day per 
kilometer of coastline. So that's about one order of magnitude higher than the fresh groundwater flux. And for those of you who, you know, I'm, I'm assuming many of you are familiar with um, the differences in uh, total SGD and saline SGD versus the fresh groundwater fluxes, one order of magnitude um, is actually kind of on the low side for total SGD compared to fresh groundwater flux. It's, it's pretty reasonable um, for, for this sort of system. Uh, so that's it for my uh, radium uh, points. I just want to give a little bit of a plug for my other research, which deals more with mercury. Um, so uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about why we actually care about groundwater in the Arctic. Um, why are we trying so hard to figure out uh, whether or not it's an important source to these coastal systems? So the Arctic uh, isn't just unique because of this freeze and thaw. Um, it's also unique because um, of the tundra and because of atmospheric patterns which concentrate a lot of aerosols and volatile elements up towards the poles. So um, tundra soils are extremely organic rich um, and go down into peat and then finally permafrost. Um, these soils um, are created and sustained by the tundra plants above them and these plants often take up toxins such as mercury that have traveled there from lower latitudes and end up being deposited in these peat layers um, due to the root systems of these plants. This is um, some preliminary data from our August 2021 trip um, compared to total mercury concentrations in groundwater and surface water uh, from other northern hemisphere sites uh, where both of these have um, been sampled. And as you can see, our groundwater from Simpson Lagoon is considerably higher than most of these other sites that have been sampled. Exceptions being Stimson Beach and Elkhorn Slough, um, both of which have mild contamination from nearby human activities. So considering the fact that Simpson Lagoon's groundwater is in a semi-pristine environment, um, this is a significant amount of mercury to be found um, and potentially input into the coastal system if groundwater is important. We also observed evidence of mercury transformations within the salinity mixing zone of uh, the, the narrow or sorry, shallow um, aquifer uh, that we see in Simpson Lagoon. Um, we measured both total mercury and methyl mercury with methyl mercury being uh, a little bit more important in terms of the ecosystem as it's a neurotoxin. We saw both of them uh, appear to have um, some sort of transformation within the salinity mixing zone, which might facilitate higher discharge rates of these elements into the lagoon. Um, so this is one reason why we don't just want to look at the freshwater concentrations. We're also interested in um, the way that these elements change as they uh, interact with saline SGD. And finally, um, when we look at the SGD fluxes, um, which I've put at the top again, just uh, so you can remember, we see that um, groundwater inputs um, total mercury on the same order of magnitude in the same range actually as um, the rivers that are discharging into Simpson Lagoon. Um, and um, it's likely discharging higher rates of methyl mercury, um, despite the water discharge not being as high. So yeah, um, I would like to acknowledge all of my lovely collaborators who are shown above. Um, there are all the people that I've done field work with up in Simpson Lagoon. I'd also like to thank the NSF who supported this research and the MIT Huey Joint Program, um, as well as the University of Yukon, uh, sorry, University of Connecticut um, and Robert Mason's lab where I run my mercury samples um, and the Beaufort Lagoon um, LTER, which Simpson Lagoon is a part of. Um, yeah, so that's it. And thank you for listening and I will take questions. Thanks, Emma. Great work. All right. Um, any questions from the audience?
if you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself and uh, talk. Hey, this is Alicia Wilson. Oh, Alicia. Hey, good to see all of you. And uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the large signal of radium during the freeze up uh, period. And your first other possible uh, in, um, reason for that was high sustained easterly winds that decreased the water level in the lagoon. Um, so you were uh, said maybe that could increase wind driven circulation through the bottom sediments. My question to you is how much the water level declined in the lagoon? Yeah, so um, in general, the lagoon's about two meters deep. During the sustained uh, wind period, it decreased by 0.6 meters, so uh, pretty substantially. Oh, okay, because my, my thought is that um, a decline that much 60 centimeters could actually increase the could could drain areas that hadn't drained when the water levels were higher. So you might be legitimately getting much more groundwater flow even during the period that things were freezing. Yeah, that's a good thought. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm gonna follow uh, Alisa's question. Um, you thought the um, you thought the SVD is uh, mainly because of the resuspension of the sediments, the water release. Is that is that correct? Sorry, what? Um. I mean, uh, you are talking about the wind driven, the wind blowing, and the uh, sediment resuspension. Um, so, what kind of SVD are we talking about? It's not fresh groundwater. For sure, um, is it a is it a kind of a short time scale and a, and a spatial scale poor uh, release because of the resuspension? Um, so I wasn't thinking too much about resuspension. I was thinking more about um, uh, wind driven circulation through the bottom sediments. So um, higher invective flow through the bottom sediments due to higher currents and and more waves. Did you say the makeup of the sediments was on the bottom of the uh, lagoon? It's like a, a silty sand, silty clay. I wonder how much of that exchange there would be. Marcus Hoodle's cutoff for that kind of thing is uh, 10 to minus 12 meters squared, I think, for permeability. Or maybe it's 10 to minus 10. I can't remember. I just think of, of sands that that happens. And once you start getting into silty or certainly clay things, then you're getting into the realm of, I mean, that's why those old, those, those meetings back in the day were permeable sediments because they were so excited that the sands were permeable enough to allow this exchange. So, um, so that's a, another interesting point. Yeah, I, so I have been um, looking at that a bit more. Um, I didn't add it to the talk because it's still, I'm still kind of working at it. Um, I have the hydraulic conductivity um, for a lot of the sands. Um, so I've been attempting to model um, that advective flow to see if it's possible. Um, and we see that, um, you know, it, uh, with, with the wind speeds and the depth, it does appear that there is some exchange. Um, it's not a lot, um, but uh, it's, you know, it comes to about 10% of the water volume of the SGD um, estimate. Wow, that's higher than I would have thought. I would have discounted it given the composition of the sediments. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so, well, we did a simulation of the uh, simulation experiment. You're trying to avoid the resuspension of the sediments, right? You only account for the diffusion. Um, mm -hmm. So why you you... You, you try to uh, avoid the resuspension part because resuspension could lead to higher radium release, but it's not as really. Um, if you don't count that part, you know, <laughs> or is that also count for as really? Yeah, no, I, I, I did do it, but it, it came to like 
less than 1% of the radium that was being, uh, the radium excess. So I didn't really talk about it because it wasn't, um, it didn't appear to be that important. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, hi, Emma, great talk. Nice to see you all, very interesting. Uh, maybe I missed this, but I'm curious uh, if radium-228 was also considered. And then you talked about the high organic content of these uh, soils, sediments. So I'm wondering if the partition coefficient here for your site is very different from some other sites. There's also an area that we are actively trying to figure out. Um, were the the two twenty eight um, we're still working on it because the the radium content in these uh, groundwater samples and uh, lagoon samples is so low that for a lot of the samples we can't get we we can't see two twenty eight on gamma. Um, so what we're doing right now is um, we've got some preliminary two twenty eight from uh, August, but we're still waiting. Uh, to get more ingrowth from thorium um, to C228 for the more recent sampling periods. So that's why I didn't talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. And for the, the coefficient, um, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure that out. We're thinking about maybe trying to do some experiments, but we're not quite sure yet. Okay. Natasha? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Emma, this is really, really nice talk. I enjoy so much your data and your findings. And I have a little bit of experience in that working with different isotopes with radon. And I found in my paper the discharge rates that we um, calculated based on the radon model. Unfortunately, it's in centimeters per day, and I cannot do the conversions in cubic meters per day to compare to yours. Um, but anyways, I'm just curious because you asked a question before your uh, presentation, whether this is groundwater. And I wanna bring you back to that thought of, is it meltwater or groundwater? Do you say, is it meltwater? Yes, because this is an area with continuous permafrost, very thick permafrost. We did uh, some ERT measurements there, electrical resistivity. And so um, I always question myself how groundwater flows through this thick permafrost. Yeah. Um, so that's that's interesting. And, and that's why I think in June, we, we really weren't seeing any groundwater. Um, as the active layer thickens in, in the open water period, um, I do think that you know, some of that water is going to be meltwater coming from um, the permafrost ice. Well, not permafrost ice, but that, the ice as the soil continues to thaw. But um, we observed when there was a storm event or even when it hasn't rained for a little bit, you you have this saturated layer. Um, I mean, this, this peat layer retains uh, water pretty well. So when you have a storm event, it pushes a lot of the water that's been sitting um, in this layer out into the lagoon. Um, and so you're right, there's probably quite a bit uh, that's meltwater, but um, the volumes that we're, we're seeing, um, a lot of the, the water that's coming in is probably due to rain events during the course of the open water period. Um, but you're right, it's, it's a very narrow layer of soil. It's very different from what might be considered an aquifer in a more temperate region. We're, we're calling it an aquifer, but it's really this thin layer of very organic rich, thick soil that water is moving through. Um, that changes as you get into the lagoon, you know, the active layer is, is a lot deeper, um, you know, up to, a, up to a meter or even deeper once you get into the, the deeper sediments in the lagoon. But for the land side, yeah, it's, it's a very, thin, shallow layer of soil. So um, because you touched on, on these um, aquifers, if we can even call them aquifers in these areas, I was wondering how the Darcy's calculations were done based on um, the lack of hydrological data there. If you can, um, yeah. Well, that was done. Uh, so Chansu is, is this lovely 
person up here. Um, mm -hmm. And she did a ton of work um, in order to get data to do the Darcy's calculations. Um, I was not a part of that, so I, I did not participate in the hydrological side. Um, but, um, you know, she did it by gathering physical data in order to make those estimates. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy your talk. Did you guys try uh, red eye steps? Um, we did the first summer. Uh, there was a lot of issues with the cold affecting the batteries. So there was, um, we weren't able to get a continuous wait on uh, series because whenever we would leave it overnight, the batteries would die. Um, but the values that we saw on radon were also somewhat low. Um, okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> and more questions? Wait, I'm just going to chime in as someone who grew up near the Alcorn Slough. The locals call it a slough instead of a slough. It rhymes with stew. That's good to know. I had only <laughs> seen that written, so thank you. I know. Yeah, and I think it's pronounced differently other places, but now you will sound like a local. <laughs> All right. I, I, I know maybe it's not going to work, but I, I, I remember Matt mentioned um, uh, you guys are collecting the uh, iridium ice steps uh, continuously, and you get the uh, uh, the the the, the iridium ice steps. Uh, if I remember right, all year round. And uh, when I saw the title of your talk, you're talking about the seasonal uh, stuff. I kind of. Uh, uh, curious if it's uh, about that kind of data. Um, so uh, again, maybe it's not your work, but uh, uh, <laughs> did you guys have any further uh, results on that part? The uh, seasonal radium, uh, the, uh, the 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 pattern, the changing pattern, pattern uh, in Arctic Ocean. I don't know uh, about the ocean. I, I know that this is the first seasonal study for groundwater in the Arctic, um, I think. Um, yeah, Vocha, what <clears throat> I think what you're talking about is our time series radium sampler, which we have deployed in the open Arctic Ocean um, on the eastern side, trying to see what's coming off of the eastern Arctic shelves. Yeah. And we're collecting those samplers on a cruise this summer. So if they worked, we should have at two locations monthly radium data for a two-year period mm -hmm. from that area. So is it you guys are still working on that? Do you have any um, preliminary results on that? Not yet. Um, at the, I'll be showing that at the Polar Sciences Symposium in Japan in a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll be there. All right, I, I, I saw Cassie uh, Tamir. Yes, sorry, um, I cut off quickly. So uh, I wanted to hop in and answer uh, Natasha's question uh, about the groundwater or uh, just, you know, rainwater or snow water, melt water. Uh, that's a really uh, uh, important, I think, discussion we need to have uh, separately uh, because you're right this so we made we had some isotope isotopical measurements in this site we also have piezometer uh, observations uh, we were able to measure head um, so when we put the piezometer in the ground we we are able to see water uh, measure water change in water level so it's like uh, it's like any other coastal aquifer uh, all the measurements are uh, can be done in these small, shallow aquifers. So that's why we call it an aquifer and an and groundwater. Uh, but you're right. So the isotopical measurements are showing that this water is uh, is a meteoric origin. It's basically uh, rainwater, snowmelt, and permafrost thaw. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a discussion for sure uh, if we should call this a groundwater or not. But uh, it starts in the in the in the tundra, and then 
within the active layer. So it's it, it was born there and then it's starts flowing to the to the lagoons or the coastal waters. So I think we can call it groundwater since it's in the ground. Uh, but um, yeah, it's definitely a <laughs> it's a valid valid concern. Uh, I I'm with you there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate your um, picking up on this. I honestly, when I was doing my work, I had an issue about, with this because uh, we did different levels of permafrost, permafrost coverage. We started in, somewhere down in the southern part of Alaska, moved up north where you work. Mm -hmm. And my memory just physically was that as we were going towards more continuous permafrost coverage, and the water that we were collected was like obviously melt water, like to me, I don't know. And but you're right, if it has been in contact with some ground, we might as well call it groundwater. But it's a super interesting discussion, and I totally agree we should have it sooner or later. Yeah, definitely. And, and like um, our other uh, collaborators, they uh, also Emma, like they're the, cl cl the collected groundwater samples are, it's like a, co it looks like a coffee. It's like- I have a picture right here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so it's like high. I know. It matter. Uh, yeah. It's definitely has a long time in the ground to get that much of organic matter in it. So um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, girls. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. It was a great talk. Okay. Um, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank uh, both Emma and uh, Matt again. Uh, great talk and a great work. Um, all right. Bye-bye. Uh, see you guys later. Great to see everybody. Take care. Thanks, Bo Chow, for inviting us. My pleasure, Matt. I hope uh, to see you somewhere face to face again. Me too. And we'll be sending you some uh, updated calibrations for the gamma sediment data. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to that too. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah, thank you. See ya. A good day. Bye, Bill.